It's a pleasure for me to introduce to you Mr. Stefan Pripsch, uh, who is uh, one of the co-founders of uh, the PHP CC, the PHP consultancy company, a uh, colleague of Mr. Sebastian Bergman, they're working together on helping software teams uh, achieve better quality uh, on, the, on their work, and he's uh, also a proven scalability expert because he's a father of twins. <laughs> so, your applause for Mr. Stefan Pripsch, please. Thanks. I'll, I'll skip my introduction um, and cut right to the chase um, so we can save time. Um, time is rather, rather limited. Um, can I get a show of hands? Who is familiar with the term being Rasmus? Okay, being Rasmus, you know who Rasmus is, right? Rasmus Ledov is like the original founder of PHP. The term being Rasmus refers to a conference is going on, you have multiple tracks, and somebody gets virtually no attendees because you have Rasmus speaking in the other room. Are you aware of the fact that there is another presentation going on next? I really appreciate everybody being here. Um, so, Michelangelo has shared so many um, insights, and Sebastian did. Um, here's my little piece of advice. Don't be scared to get out there and start speaking. First time I ever spoke at a conference. I actually Rasmus Zevsuraski. I got like 80 attendees and he got like 10. And first time I ever spoke at an international conference, I think that was ZentCon whenever. I was being Rasmus by Yahoo throwing a party the night before and I had the first slot, so basically I had nobody show up. <laughs> um, can happen to anybody and it really, really depends on a lot of circumstances, right? Okay, we'll skip that. Um, I'm the guy who gets randomly quoted in other people's presentations and we'll cut right to the chase. Um, I usually, I, I did that presentation before at a user group in Munich, which originally sort of brought material from two presentations I had given before together. And as I was listening to Michelangelo's keynote and Sebastian's talk earlier today, I figured that the presentation is not right for the conference, so I rewrote it. And I typed the code examples right there into the presentation, and I'm sure I have left a few syntax errors for you to discover. So who is familiar with the term or the concept of MVC? Okay, I mean, that's pretty much everybody. Um, and you all have seen that. By the way, that's wrong, um, <laughs> because they have one arrow pointing in the wrong direction, but I'm completely incapable of using graphics software, so I tend to steal those things from the, from the net somewhere. Um, this is what MVC is all about, and I'm going to make that very, very short, right? It's a UI pattern, and its purpose is you have a UI, you have the same information in multiple places in different visual representations, right? So that number there, the revenue, you have it up here, and you have it, well, it's probably that one, right? Um, how are you going to implement code that makes sure that those multiple views on the same data keep in sync? This is what MVC back in the 70s was originally designed for. Now, um, I like to quote Martin Fowler, and he's a bit confused about people using MVC as a UI pattern. And he says, well, basically, I don't know what people are doing, but sometimes it may even be MVC. The problem, and he is talking about UI patterns, the, the problem with uh, writing PHP software for the web, that's not the UI you are writing. Okay, so MVC on the web, that's really a whole different story, because if we go back to this, the, the meaning of that is, okay, we have a controller that observes the view, the view is a GUI component, and if somebody changes data there, the com controller gets notified and makes a decision to update the model, which is that error right here, and the model then is being observed by the view, and the view pulls data from the model, because the model has said the views, hey, I've changed, so the views pull the state from the model. That's very, very short, and I'm, I'm sure you all have heard that. The, the cool thing is it totally does not apply to the web, right? Because on the web, 
the view is remote. We have a system boundary right here. So all those two subject observer relationships from a technology point of view don't work in the first place. But the good news is the problem that MVC solves, which is synchronizing multiple views on the same data, we don't have that problem in the first place. No web application has this problem because you're just creating one page. So without going into depth, this is what you have to ask your favorite search engine for. I have given um, a bunch of presentations on that topic. And if you're interested in finding out more, this is what you need to search for. And it's going to come up with a bunch of material and presentations. Um, I've, I think two or three years ago, I gave a keynote at some conference where I had actually written an MVC play and had people on stage to act out MVC as a pattern. And there's a video on that on the, on the web. So if you're... Um, if you're interested, you can find that and have a look at that. So, who's familiar with the term solid? Okay. So, school book definition of solid, drawn from Wikipedia, as all good developers draw their school book definitions from. Um, basically, if you stick to a couple of principles, solid is an acronym, right? Uh, it's, it represents five principles. If you stick to those five principles, your code is going to be maintainable which implies that if you do not stick to solid, your code is not going to be maintainable. And this is a big problem for a lot of teams and companies dealing with outrageous numbers of lines of legacy code. It's not maintainable. And mind you, there is a difference between maintainable and extensible, right? Extensible means I can add new functionality. That's relatively easy to do, even with crappy code, because you can always do that in a decent fashion. Not a lot of people do, but you could. Um, changing it is harder. If your company's business changes, you need to adapt code to changing business needs, and the code is hard to maintain, it's hard to change, that's a bad position to be in, and we all know that. And my presentation is going to be about trying to point you at some things that people tend to get wrong in current MVC type of setups and give you some ideas of how I think you could do things better and then leave you with a lot of room for thought. Um, and I'll be around till um, tomorrow in the afternoon. So if you have any additional questions, if you want to have a discussion, if you have wanted to have a chat, drop me a line or just find me as I walk the grounds. Uh, the SOLID acronym basically goes back to this book, Bertrand Meyer, Object Oriented Software Construction, that's been published in 1983, I believe. Don't read that book. <laughs> it's impossible to read. Um, I think he's, he's a professor. I think he has a mathematician background and he manages to come up with formulas and stuff that no, no sane person can understand. Maybe that is why Michael Feathers and, and Robert C. Martin, Uncle Bob, have sort of come up um, with the solid acronym. And the principles go back to 1983, so everything has already been there then. And us developers did a really, 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 really great job in forgetting all that. So we have to relearn. Solid. Those are the five principles. I'll just go over them briefly. Um, um, the focus of this talk is to see how those principles apply to MVC or where things that we commonly do violate those principles. And if you want to dig into those principles, it's going to take you um, quite some time to get warm with some of the principles. So single responsibility is pretty simple. It sort of ties into separation of concerns. Have one class do one thing. It sounds so, so simple, right? Another way of looking at that is how many reasons are there to change a piece of code? If there are two different reasons, obviously the, t the code has two responsibilities. And if you separate them, you arrive, you get closer to a design where, well, if I change this, this is the piece of code that I have to touch. If I change that, I have to touch another piece of code. But I'm limiting the possibility of side effects happening. The open-closed principle originally refers pretty much to compiled environments where you have a large monolithic binary end up on the server. And you don't want to give companies that have bought your software potentially 
the, the, the possibility to compile the software. So how could they possibly get extensions or adaptations into the software? So you need a kind of plug-in mechanism. And this is basically what open-closed principle in essence states. You need this to be extensible. You don't want to recompile 10 million lines of code if you add one, right? With PHP, we don't really have that problem. That's one of the cool things about PHP. Still, we can apply the open-closed principle um, in a bit of a different way and look at how can we extend classes and um, how can we write code so in a way that it's easy and safe to extend classes and how can we prevent people from screwing up as they extend our own classes. Um, we'll touch upon that a bit later. Liskov substitution principle, I think, is the, the most complicated one to really understand. Sometimes I'm not sure whether I have really fully understand it. The way I interpret it is, is in short, inter inheritance sucks. Okay? So there is a lot of problems potentially associated with the concept of inheritance. In fact, some people say you don't need inheritance. Some strict OOP proponents say, well, you, ju you just should extend from an abstract base class and never anything else. Whether you want to be that relig religious or not, sometimes it makes sense. Um, it, inheritance is a problematic concept. So what Liskov states basically is, if you write a class and you extend it, then the subclass must be substitutable for the base class. So you can't have less functionality. That also means you can't have new return types or new return values. So imagine you have a class that does something and it, throws, it never throws an exception. It never does. Now you create a subclass and this subclass throws an exception in a certain case. That's extending the API. That's an additional return value. And the code working with the subclass will not expect this exception because it was not part of the original contract with the class he was working with. So weird things might happen because the code calling that doesn't know how to deal with that exception. So that's a very, very short and concise uh, attempt at explaining the Liskov substitution principle. Interface segregation, that's a very interesting one. Clients should not be forced to depend upon interfaces that they do not use. That sort of translates into make your interfaces small. We'll get to that. Dependency inversion, to me that's the most interesting and most important principle and it's the least understood, I think. A lot of people say, okay, dependency inversion basically means dependency injection. Nope, that's not true. You will need dependency injection to achieve dependency inversion, but there's a lot more to dependency inversion. Um, so the text is, let's look at something in drawing, right? Dependency inversion says, this is a problem. You have your domain or your application, and that depends on some infrastructure. You may think this is natural, but it's a problem, because now if the infrastructure changes, we have to make sure that our code still works. And that's a problem. And dependency inversion says, how about inverting that dependency? How about reverting the direction of the arrow? If we can do that, that would be awesome. Because then, our domain wouldn't even know that infrastructure exists. Thus, if we change the infrastructure, there is no way that could possibly influence our domain, the core of our application. And it turns out, and again, this is a very, very short and concise um, explanation, it turns out you can achieve this by defining an interface as part of your domain, defining an infrastructure uh, and write an adapter that becomes part of the infrastructure that implements that interface. Suddenly your domain does not know about the infrastructure anymore, but your infrastructure has a dependency on the domain. That's kind of cool. And we're going to have a code example for that later. So let's dig into code, right? We are developers here, we want to look at code. Who has seen code like that? Okay. What is the problem with that? How many solid principles are we potentially violating? <laughs> Up to five, that's a good one. Thank you. <laughs> I haven't thought of that one. So it turns out that if you violate one of the solid principles, um, you probably also violate others. 
Single responsibility. How many reasons are there to change this controller? Well, if the creation needs to be done differently, that's one reason to change it. If deletion needs to be changed, that's another reason. And if index action, and honestly, I don't know what the fuck index action, how that relates to your business, but anyway, we have it. So if we need to change that, that's a third reason. So that's not single responsibility. We are also violating dependency inversion. Because this is your code and it depends on a framework. A framework is infrastructure. And as I said, inheritance is a problem. We are not really violating Liskov here, but hmm, there are some pointers at this may be smelly. You know about the term of code smells. Everybody who has children knows at some point there is smell. And if there is smell, you know, the small children, if there is smell, you need to change diapers. And as Kent Beck wrote the book on refactoring, he was looking for a term and said, OK, um, Grandma Beck told him with regards to his baby, if it smells, change the diapers. And he felt like, ah, looking at code and it's kind of smelly. So maybe something is wrong, right? So that's a code smell. And that's the solution. Break it down. Single responsibility. Have one action in each controller. Um, we can take this further. We're looking at that. Why would we have to name that index action and that create action if we have one action method in each controller in the first place? So we might actually have a common name for that, which would put us into the position of defining an interface. Now, this interface is not really meaningful to whatever you guys are doing, because if you talk to your customers, I'm sure that unless they are an accounting company, they really have no clue what a controller is. And, well, yeah, I'm, I'm running the controller, is like, uh, okay, you're executing code, okay, you do that all day. So that really doesn't give me any information. So we might need to reconsider that name. Turns out that, well, Maybe it's about processing an HTTP request, right? That's usually what the controller should do. It receives an HTTP request. It's sort of pretty far on the front end. And technically, it does input mapping. It converts the HTTP request to something which may be another type of request or just a method call on some business object. Some people like to call it a model that your application or domain can deal with. So technically, controllers are input mappers. With regard to single responsibility, that's a very interesting observation.